Hello, and uh, what we're going to try to do today is a little quick um, lesson on ecology. This is actually Ecology 1. I'm talking about this bright blue spinning marble in space. This is actually an Apollo shot. I want to say Apollo 8, one of the first uh, images of the Earth rising um, over the moon's landscape as they were orbiting the moon for the first time. Um, I got this PowerPoint from uh, this site down here, as you can see, and if I click, uh, we should be able to highlight that whole thing. Um, with this PowerPoint, I'm not going to be able to draw things as well. I mean, I guess I basically can go in and, and hit this pen down here and draw. Um, like I could go in here and just say, uh, draw a nice little smiley face on the earth. And uh, other things on the moon, but I'm not going to try to do that. So I'm going to go back to the arrow get to the next one. So what we're going to do is we're going to study organisms. Uh, we're going to study organisms, how they act with uh, others of the same species, as well as how they act, uh, act with uh, others of uh, other species, whether it be plant or animal. And this is a cartoon image of the Earth. Um, we'll talk about or the organism level, which can actually be an autotroph, uh, which is an auto producer, auto energy. Um, they're also known as producers. Um, they're ones that can take the sun's energy, turn it into sugar primarily, um, or they can take some other chemicals uh, deep down in the ocean, uh, sulfur products, and turn them into uh, a usable form for themselves and other ones. Uh, other organisms are called heterotrophs, other energy. Uh, they are consumers. They can be herbivores if they're plant eaters, carnivores if they're meat eaters, insectivore, special type of carnivore, insective eater. Um, they can be decomposers that break down all of the above into their organic and inorganic molecules that can be used again. Symbiotic uh, organisms that actually work together for a common good. Um, we can have commensalism um, where they actually go together and they don't really benefit from it or get harmed. We have mutualism where at least one gets uh, help, probably both. And we have parasitism where one of them actually gets the good stuff and the other one has to pay for it. Then we'll talk about populations where we get an organism of the same type interacting with each other. Probably the biggest uh, way that these guys actually work together in uh, terms of their own um, existence. Communities where we get different populations of different organisms and they work together throwing in um, abiotic and biotic systems for an ecosystem. And then we have the biosphere, the living sphere of the Earth, all encompassed, encompassed in an Earth view. Here are some images of the things I just talked about. Um, we have a, a producer, an autotroph, taking the sun's energy, producing um, plant material that can be utilized by other organisms. Um, here is a plant that actually lives, it's called a Venus flytrap, that lives in an area where the soil doesn't produce all the nutrients, so it has to get some of the nutrients it gets from other organisms, so it's actually a plant producer that is also a heterotroph uh, meat eater. Um, we have herbivores, we have carnivores, we have omnivores, we have decomposers, we have symbiotic relationships where the ant actually lives inside of a tree, um, and they also protect the tree from invasion of any other type of material, whether it be fungus, whether it be insect, whether it be bird, um, they'll fight to the death. Um, we have symbiotic relationships, um, the birds actually cleaning material out of the mouth of the alligator and hoping the alligator doesn't take it for lunch. And then we have, uh, there's another carnivore, uh, beautiful uh, owl. And then we have parasitism, an ichneumonid wasp um, who actually has a very long ovipositor um, producing an egg to be plant, um, put into a caterpillar, sort of like this one. You can see this one's actually um, putting its ovipositor into wood. Um, it can actually search out uh, larvae inside there. Here's an example of that ichneumonid wasp larva actually breaking out from the caterpillar skin. Um, so you can see it actually has uh, basically eaten out the inside of the caterpillar. Uh, if you want to see an eight minute video, um, you can go to this one and watch this. This is on an ichneumonid um, on a blue moth uh, found in England, or at least Great Britain. Okay, critters coping with their environment. Two things that uh, everybody has to worry about, things that are biotic, 
in other words, things that are alive, um, things that uh, may want to eat you, um, things that you may want to eat. So everybody on this planet is a prey or a predator. Um, the predator is the one who wants to eat, the prey is the one that wants to eat. So this is the food. You have competitors. Um, the biggest competitor are basically things in your species and the closer they are related to you the bigger competitor they are and you have predators you have parasites and you have disease predator prey competition so it's all works in your favor or against you um, then we have to talk about the abiotic the non-living things like uh, air sunlight temperature water humidity soil um, they give you the climate belts that are actually out there. Um, you can see we have dry climates, you have wet climates, you have mountainous climates, you have polar climates, you have tropical climates. Um, you have all different types of climates out there. And then we have population ecology, where we just don't talk about an organism. We talk about an organism dealing with other organisms of the same species. Um, probably the biggest competitor that there is. Life takes place in population. Population is a group of individuals of the same species living at the same place at the same time. You can see seals and uh, some kind of a bird. I knew what this thing was. I want to say it's a loon, but I don't think it is. But you can see that they're actually sort of marked out their own territories. You can see babies. You can see adults. You can see males and females. Um, lots of competition for space. When they're out there, they're also competing for their own food. Um, they re rely on the same resources, they interact with each other, they interbreed with each other. That makes up a population. Population ecology. We study populations because we actually want to know how they relate to their environment, how they survive, what's successful, what's not successful. And we can talk about the uh, emperor penguin, um, which you see here, very large population. Or we can talk about zebras. Uh, along with populations of other organisms that you can see hitting and missing there. You can see a tree and grassland. Um, you can see populations of grass, populations of tree. It's not just an animal population we're dealing with. But basically how the environmental factors affect the population, whether they be biotic or abiotic. Characterizing a population, describing a population in terms of its range, in terms of its spacing, in terms of its density, in terms of the size of the population. Um, this is a bird that actually moved over from Europe, and in the right around, around the 1900s, it got introduced to South America uh, by 1937, 1943, 1951, 1956, 1958. 1961, 1965, 1970. You can see by 1970 it's actually taken over um, some pretty large locations. My question was how come it didn't move down the South American coast? How come it didn't live in this part of North America? Um, why the spaces? Well, what I did is I looked at another map showing you uh, climate, and you can see that they tend to like the green, uh, tropical wet as well as uh, this grayish color, uh, human subtropical. Um, they, tried, they tend away from the arid, they tend away from highlands, they tend away from, actually uh, so they don't get anywhere close to the subarctic or tundra, but they actually do um, like different areas, but they've moved into every niche that they possibly could, all the way down to the tip of South America. So they are hitting some of these brown areas, the highlands, but they're staying close to the coast. Population range, um, geographic limitations due to bio, um, biotic and abiotic. Um, you can see the polar bear here. This is actually one in a zoo. Um, trying to give it the opinion, uh, the, the environment of being cold uh, along with rock, but the rock is man-made. Uh, this is probably man-made, probably not as cold as what the polar bear would like. And then you can see these parrots, like tropical, um, actually got a little bit of snow. Um, plants don't look too good, parrots probably not too happy. So adapted for polar regions, adapted for tropical rainforest, uh, when you actually move the polar, adapted polar into warmer climate or you move the, the rainforest into colder climate, warmer climate, colder climate, want cold, want warmth, um, it can actually change uh, the range of the population. Um, if they're able to, they could probably move. 
population spacing, dispersal patterns, um, provides insight in terms of the associations and how the populations work with each other. And there basically are three different types. You have what's called a clump population, where individuals of the same species seem to be clumped together. You can even have a uh, lone, in this case wolves. Um, but they're, they probably marked out territories, that's the hunting areas. You can have random, where you actually have like the trees here, um, not so much in um, groupings, but you can see there's a grouping there, and then there's a couple of individuals, there's areas where it's not found, and you can have uniform, where they seem to have individual places, um, but it's all based on territory, uh, whether it's sunlight and rain, whether it's uh, meat, whether it's uh, you know the nesting area. Clump pattern tends to be the most common. Um, populations like to clump together, probably for safety. Um, they can warn each other in terms of predator preys. Um, the populations are able to move from place to place. These guys are actually following the grasslands. Um, these are probably following aquatic vegetation. Um, we have uh, reef type individuals uh, staying away from things that want to eat them, trying to find things they can eat. And you can see these little um, purple flowers living in different places, maybe due to humidity, um, soil conditions. Uniform, second most obvious, um, probably results from interactions of the population in terms of territory. So territoriality, um, where you actually have nesting, where they don't want to be any closer than a couple of feet. Um, nesting, not closer than a couple of feet. Probably nesting, not being closer to a couple of feet. But the area um, is relatively small, large populations. Um, they have to learn to live together, um, but they probably do a lot of squawking and fighting, uh, very much like a higher organism, uh, us. Measuring population density, um, how do we measure how many individuals in a, are in a population? Well, it's difficult to count for most cases. Um, either we have to count them as they're moving, we have to go in and trap them and try to hope we get all the population in a certain area, but we can sort of sense um, you know, how many there are in an area, then we multiply by number of areas and we come up with populations. Population side, size, changes in population by adding or removing, um, that's usually done by birth, death, immigration, and immigration and immig I'll get it over here. So the way we add things to the population is we have births. We can also add it by immigration. Um, then we actually can have death, take them out, and emigration, we can move things out of the population. So the population is not stagnant, it can be dynamic, we can have disease wipe out large portions, we can have a very large or small population which can add a lot of individuals or very few. Um, we can have uh, individuals from a population being driven from other areas due to overpopulation um, into your area or we can have uh, stresses causing them to emigrate to move out of your area to other areas. Population growth rates, factors that affect growth rate, um, sex ratio, um, we like to have the same amount of males and females, or at least the number of males and females that actually is best for uh, the population. Sometimes we have a lot more females than we have males. Sometimes the number is closer together. Uh, generation time, how old do the females have to be to reproduce? Um, if they're born and they can get pregnant right away, populations can change very quickly. If you have to wait 14, 16, 18, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years before you can reproduce, um, you can have a big change. Age and structure, how many females at any one time are in reproductive age? That's called the cohort, number of individuals in the same sort of aspect of whatever situation we're talking about. Here's an example. This is age distribution in 2000, and here's actually some text from 2006. Um, at birth, uh, males outnumber females. These are humans um, by 1.1 to 1. So we have t one tenth more. Um, by age 15, the number has not changed. By 15 to 64, the number is getting closer to closer. 65 and over, um, now we have more females than we have males. Total population, um, we have a few more males than we have females. Um, based on this, we'd have 104 males to every 100, or we'd have 140,000 males to every 100,000 females. So numbers are very close to the same. Survivorship. Um, we basically have three different types of critters on the planet. We have one that actually lives, most of the population lives until they reach adulthood. 
Um, and then we have a very quick die-off. That's called high death rate post-reproductive years. We have one where the population seems to go down in a nice straight line. That's called constant mortality rate throughout the entire span of the life cycle of the organism. And then we have this one that has a really quick die-off and then it has a relatively stable population um, for a long time, all the way until um, the age limit. And this is percent maximum life. I'm not saying that this hydra lives as long as the human. This is 100% of its life style or a lifespan, which is probably one or a year or so. And then the oyster may live a couple years. Um, humans may actually live to be 75. This is not saying humans live to be 100. Hydra live to be 100. It's 100% of their life cycle. Here's a survival per thousand. So um, a thousand percent, if you're human, most of them are going to survive. Hydra, the number goes down pretty linearly. And oysters goes down very quickly to a nice stable uh, plateau. Trade-offs for survival and reproduction. Cost of reproduction is very expensive. Um, this particular type of the salmon um, is spawned up in the upper um, source areas of rivers. Uh, tend to be cold. Tend to be farther north, far very far north, um, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, they swim down and they spend most of their life in the ocean until they're ready to spawn, then they swim back up. And what happens is they spend so much effort coming back up that this is the last thing that they do. They get up there, they spawn, and all the adults die. Uh, some of them don't even make it to the age of uh, spawning because they get uh, eaten on the way there. Sunflowers, probably not quite the same thing. Producing lots of seeds and it can produce lots of offspring. Natural selection favors a life history that maximizes lifetime reproductive success. It's much better to reproduce over your entire life than it is to do it in uh, you know, one fell swoop. Exponential, exponential growth rate. Characteristic populations with limiting fat without living factors um, can actually have a very large increase of uh, population. This is a whooping crane. Whooping cranes um, basically were um, almost run into um, extinction uh, way back in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, we have elephant populations that looks like it was extinct. Maybe they got reintroduced um, after poaching and whatever else. But these came back after near extinction. Um, we started protecting them. Um, we started looking at uh, nesting sites. We started looking at things that would cause the young problems. And their population went from you know, maybe 10 all the way up to a much larger number and elephants from about zero to a very much larger number because we started protecting them from hunting. So exponential growth um, where growth rate doesn't go up nice and steady it can go up very 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 quickly especially with that elephant. Um, the thing is called carrying, there's one thing in there called carrying capacity. This is the maximum population that an environment can support at any one time um, based on the fact that you don't destroy that uh, environment. Here is an example of uh, the number of breeding males in terms of for, uh, fur seals. Um, 1910 number was very low. Um, this is in thousands, so like 1,000. And then we started actually finding um, the population got bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the best fit curve, um, so that we're actually now into the 10,000s and more. Here's another example. Um, this is a, a sand flea. I hate that when that happens. This is a sand flea, and you can see that they're um, going up. This is time and days. Population goes up and up and up, and we probably actually reach the carrying capacity, um, oxygen, food, temperature, space, whatever, and we find out that the population for both species, subspecies, goes down and hits a nice even number, just like it did up there. Numbers increased until the population to the environment uh, basically said this is your maximum carrying capacity, this is your maximum population density. Regulation of population size, limiting factors, food supply is a big one, predators, um, your number goes up, predator probably numbers goes up, uh, the more population, more individuals you have in a population in a certain area, disease has a good chance of getting it, um, density, these are density dependent, 
Um, basically what happens is uh, as the density goes up, food supply goes down, competition goes up, predators goes up, disease goes up, and density independent, um, abiotic factors, um, you could run out of space, um, you could run out of food, um, you could uh, have trouble marking uh, territories and um, have invasions of, of your own species moving into your own area. Predator-prey interactions. Um, this is a snow hare and a lynx, and you can see that the lynx population, which is red, tends to go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Doesn't get as high as the snow hare, um, but as it goes down, population of snow hares goes up. Their population goes up, snow hare goes down, and you can see they kind of mirror each other. As this, the, the prey population goes up, the predator population goes up as well. Reproductive strategies, there's two types. There's what's called the K-selected and there's what's called the R-selected. This baboon, um, I'm sorry, orangutan is a very good example of a K-selected and this moth is very good for an R. K-selected have late reproduction. You actually have to wait years before you can reproduce. They have few number of offspring and the big thing is they invest a lot of time and a lot of effort um, actually trying to raise that little baby. Um, primates, very good example. Coconut tree is a good example. R selected, early reproduction, many, many offspring, little to no parental care, and insects do this and most plants do that. Trade-offs, number and size of offspring versus survival. Um, have small offspring, have lots of them, and you probably have a pretty good chance that they're going to survive have larger offspring and the reason the coconut is considered a K population is because they actually put in quite a bit of food material in there for the developing embryo um, to make sure that each one of these things has a very good chance of survival and I like this one praying mantis mom talking to all of its little babies that just hatched of course long before you mature most of you will be eaten so uh, very little protection if she sat there um, almost everybody would stay away R selected, K selected. Human population, what factors contributed to the exponential growth of humans? For a long time, 10,000 years ago, our population was very low. Um, you can see this is in billions, um, so million would be uh, about a hundredth of that, so we were less than one million people, maybe right around a million, and we did that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And then the numbers started to get a little bigger. Now why did it get bigger? We probably got better at um, growing food. Maybe actually brought um, animals and domesticated them. But the, anim the number went up and you can see it went down. Uh, we had big changes and then uh, it started going back up. There was a big drop right there and then it starts going up and now it's actually going up linear and this is 2005 for 6 billion. Um, you guys all know later on this year we're going to get 7 and uh, it's going to keep going up faster and faster and faster. Bubonic plague, Black Death, knocked out a very large portion of uh, Europe. Ev uh, Industrial Revolution, um, we had more time to actually play because our machine got machines to do some of our work. And then we have advances in science and technology um, and all this leads to exponential growth where the growth is going up almost vertically um, adding 82 million people per year back in 2005 I'm sure that number is much larger now if you actually wanted to see some things you could go to these uh, applets and you can actually see world population you can also see future population two very good sites any questions it's hard walking on this stuff Yep, son, we've met our enemy, and he is us. Something to think about. Hope you enjoyed it. Catch you later. Bye.